Good morning, everybody. Um, a bit late now, isn't it? Um, I spent uh, 50 years of my working life as a photographer, and I retired five years ago. Uh, since when I haven't actually picked up a camera. <laughs> People sort of say, oh, if you're a photographer, you're a photographer for life. That is not the case. I think people like bus drivers, when they retire, they don't drive buses. Anyway, uh, this is um, a sort of personal history of photography from, from my point of view. Uh, and I throw a bit of early stuff in as well. Um, so I hope you like it. <laughs> um, in the 18th century, uh, you're like this. <laughs> in the 18th century, uh, your only way of recording sites was getting maybe a, a topographical artist to draw, to draw it or, or something like this. Uh, this photograph is an illustration from uh, Angerstein, who was uh, a Swedish industrial spy. And I don't know if you've ever seen his diary, well worth looking at, really brilliant. You, really good illustration showing the processes. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, then you have people like uh, Paul, Paul Sandby, who was uh, actually a, a cartographer by trade, which probably explains his attention to detail. Because uh, he became a topographical illustrator, and his work is really, really beautiful. Uh, then you get the oil paintings, but oil paintings, you don't get so many of these industrial sites because essentially you needed a very wealthy patron to pay for these because these are big oil paintings and they were very expensive. So your recording on this sort of site was quite limited. Uh, with this, you, you, it's more the sort of sublime art, which people <coughs> like something big and powerful. But then uh, 1826, we have the first surviving photograph. Uh, this one, I mean, it's strangely, when you look at this, they say uh, it was perhaps eight hours or several days exposure. So I'm not quite sure what they mean by that because there's a massive difference. I can only assume that perhaps it was recorded over several days and they thought it was maybe eight hours of daylight. I don't really know. But um, after this, 1839, you've got the daguerreotype which uh, was fantastic for detail, but it was a positive process. So the image you got was a positive, which you couldn't reproduce from. Um, when, it, um, when you moved on from that to the color type, uh, suddenly people realized that this was the way forward for recording. <laughs> you may not like this, <laughs> but um, uh, John, John Bourne, uh, Cook Bourne, was, um, he was a, a, an illustrator. And he realized what the advantages would be for photography for recording things because you could get the accuracy. And he was commissioned to photograph the, or to record the Kiev Bridge. So he decided to do it photographically. And these are the end results. Um, but this was the start of sort of the, the golden era of, of uh, civil engineering. So photography was here and you could record these amazing things. This is the Manchester Ship Canal, actually very close to where I went to primary school. <laughs> and the fourth road bridge. Uh, you can see the, the detail here is, is a bit uh, blurred. I suspect that this is probably from, um, from a, a, a color type. And because it was paper based, you had to do your copy through the paper. So you get that sort of slight diffusion. That's where the, 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 the daguerreotype was better because it was much sharper. Uh, but really from, from um, from this period, where money was going to be was with the general public, because up till now, you couldn't have pictures of your, of your nearest and dearest and your families and all the rest of it. So uh, suddenly, photography was taking off photographing people. Now, 1839, the Welsh, the, the sorry, Welsh, I say, the French government in their, in their good thinking, they actually bought the patent from Daguerre and gave it free to the French public. Uh, but, uh, in Britain, of course, with a free market economy, uh, Richard Beard bought the, the patent from Daguerre and uh, you had to buy a, a license which cost several hundred pounds. Bear in mind, this is the 1840s. That's serious money. So uh, if you wanted a photograph of your family, it was going to cost you two guineas when uh, a skilled worker was only getting about 50p a week. So this was really, you know, that's, <laughs> that's where money came in. But given time, Uh, given 20 years, the price came down, and so it became much more common for people to have photographs of their nearest and dearest. Um, 1986, uh, sorry, 1886, sorry, I can't even read. Um, 1886, there was a, a photographic practice in Keswick doing portrait work, 
it isn't one of theirs, I might say. It's some, the people called the, the Abraham's brothers. Mm. Now, the Abraham's brothers, um, they had two sons, George and Ashley, and they were very keen rock climbers. And they could see, you can see where I'm going with this, uh, <laughs> they could see that um, there would be a good commercial um, process with, with photographs of climbing. And so they started taking rock climbing photographs. Now, bear in mind, you're carrying a heavy tripod, 12 glass plates of eight and a half by six and a half inches, um, dot cloth overhead for, record, for, for, for uh, actually looking at the ground glass screen. And the film was so slow that you, your exposure is about four seconds. So this is really amazing. They, they waited for overcast conditions because if it was sunny, it, the contrast was too high. So they ideally wanted overcast conditions when it was slightly duller. So you're talking about a four second exposure for people doing rock climbing. Uh, I sort of, I used to look at these and think, good heavens, you know, the professionalism and the trouble to go to, to do this sort of thing. Uh, this is a photograph I bought from Fishers in, in Keswick, which was their old studio. And uh, I've got this on my wall at home. And the detail is absolutely fantastic. You can see all the nails on the boots. You know, to do this sort of work, uh, it just sort of you know, beggars belief what they were doing. Um, so, of course, when I started doing this uh, 100 years later, of course, I got fast film, I've got a small camera to hold, and it's easy. I also got a nylon rope, which is damn sight safer than pearl on. So, Avon Gorge in 1970. You have a lot more traffic on that road now, it doesn't stop. <laughs> uh, but back to, uh, back to uh, old photography, 1903. At this point, this is the, the first manned flight. So you can see how photography has moved forward. Suddenly you want news pictures. Everyone wants news. They want to see what's happening. So because of this, if you came to running an, ex an expedition, it wasn't good enough to be able to write about it. You have to have illustration. And it wasn't drawings and paintings. It was photographs. So going out on the Terra, uh, Terra Nova expedition, this is Scott's expedition to the, the uh, South Pole, uh, they have a photographer working full time on this. And uh, you probably somebody will know some of these pictures, they're really well known. And they are stunning images. But again, this is, this is working with glass plates. And uh, Scott's party, when they go to the South Pole, you know, they get there, alas, they don't survive. But the critical thing, they had to have photographs. Now, the endurance in 1914, it was, uh, it was uh, a, 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 a trans uh, uh, Trans-Antarctic expedition. And the, the boat, of course, was crushed by ice. And when the boat was sinking, the priority was to rescue 500 glass plates from the base of it. When you consider that you're actually in Antarctica and there's nobody to come to save you and you're rescuing the photographs. That's how important it was. Uh, I mean, seven of them had to row in the winter of, of the, uh, uh, across the, um, across the, uh, Antarctic uh, Ocean for 800 miles to get a rescue. And they're still taking photographs. <laughs> uh, now, you've moved 16 years on from the first flight, and this is how fast it's moving. 16 years from actually managing to take off, they've actually flown across from America. So that's how fast technology is moving here. Mind you, you wouldn't have this sort of landing. <laughs> you wouldn't like that at all, would you? But I think they survived anyway. Um, now, I went to Sorcerer's College of Art and I studied uh, commercial industrial photography. And uh, at that time, um, it was considered that um, the, the critical thing was quality. So for, for high quality work, you use large format cameras. The approach, it was, it was very considered and it demanded good technique. So all your training for three years was on that basis. And uh, you understand when you're carrying gear like this, um, you want good quality because you don't want to do this and come out with rubbish. <laughs> um, when it came to exteriors, the critical thing is, is, is being in the right place at the right time of day. Uh, I've been asked to take this photograph um, for a Mountain Magazine, and what they wanted was an illustration of, of the face. And it only gets the sun uh, in, in sort of on New Year's Day at dawn. So you've actually, I had to drive up from London and walk up into Scarfell 
and be there waiting for it. <laughs> uh, but that's what it's all about. <laughs> we like doing long days. Uh, now this is uh, this is working for the commission again. You want high quality. You want to be able to see, see detail. Uh, this is what five four monorail does really well. Problem with something like this is again this is very early in the morning, and uh, the approach is through a farm. And I knew full well that if you walk through a farm at four o'clock in the morning, you'll have all the farm dogs going berserk, and you'll have the police descending on you as well. So I had to divert from the road and climb over the hedges and fences and get all the way around to the far side of the, of the, uh, of the farm so I could take the pictures. <laughs> and that was just hoping that someone's going to come out that morning. This is uh, the Athlete Quarry. Um, this, is, this doesn't exist anymore. This has actually been filled in completely. When they filled it in, they found that the, the local white boys have been dropping cars into, into this quarry uh, for insurance jobs. <laughs> Uh, I had to abseil down the back face with the camera to get this. And it hadn't occurred to me, of course, to get it back out again afterwards. But you, know, you think of these things too late, really. Uh, I, I went in to photograph the, uh, the Penring quarries before they filled these in. There was a, a directive that they couldn't extend the quarries, so they filled them in instead. And the, uh, all the equipment was still in place. It was absolutely beautiful, absolutely stunning stuff. But uh, actually, prior to, to actually photographing this, um, uh, someone had told me that it was possible to get into the underground workings at the quarry here. But there's no way you approach uh, a quarry company and say, please can I go underneath? Because uh, it was immediately opposite their blasting face. And you know they weren't going to say yes. Uh, this is where I get into trouble. Because uh, I would take the approach that if you wanted to photograph, and you didn't think they'd say yes, the best thing to do is to take it and hope nobody found, found out. And if they did, you'd just apologize after them. I got very good at apologizing. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the replacements to magnesium flash powder. Now, the old photographers used magnesium flash powder. You'd have a sort of tray in it, and you'd go to a wedding, and you'd sort of fire the thing off, light the site, and then you would rush from the room because basically all that smoke was going to send a smuts on everybody's clothes. Yeah. But uh, that was replaced by flash bulbs. These are big flash bulbs. Um, the the Ministry of Defence may still use them for I know. They used to use, use them on the range at South End. They had huge great frames with hundreds of these on, and they would people employ people full time to screw these things in, because each one of these is about ten thousand watts, and they're very good for doing interiors. Now this is the underground pumping station that I wasn't going to have permission to go and do. I did ask a few years later, and they said, oh, no, it's far too dangerous. You can't go in now. I knew that was going to be what they said. So I just thought, well, never mind. It'll be fine. We've got the picture. Um, with this, I, I made the equipment for, for lighting this. Uh, it, so it's multiple lights. And they all have to be joined by cables. Now, as I said, this is underground. Actually, you're in pitch darkness. So you have to pull your lighting out in pitch darkness, trying to work out in your head what result you're going to get, which is really entertaining. Um, it, it's, my, it's easy with a 5.4 camera because you could put a, a light either side of the subject and you didn't have to use a dark shot because you're in the dark. You could see the, the screen and you could see where the lights were so you could position it. So it's a lot easier than trying to use a 35 millimeter camera or something like that. Uh, this is approached actually underground through the old adits. They were slightly added such about waist deep in water. You had to crawl in to start with and you had to go for a mile from Bethesda right up to the quarries to get to this. <laughs> That's why they weren't going to let me in, I think. Uh, that's the uh, the PF hundred. These are about, I think, about ten thousand watts each bulb. That's why they're really useful, but expendable, so expensive. Uh, this is Gating Gill Main Chamber in Yorkshire. Uh, that's lit with these PF hundreds, and uh, it's a three hundred foot winch descent on a wire to get in there with the equipment. <laughs> when they strapped me into the little cage to go down, uh, they said, uh, "They said, oh, we don't usually put people in carrying this much gear." And as they lowered me off the edge. I turned upside down. So I did the whole descent 300 foot upside down in the dark, straight. <laughs> um, the expendable bars are, are far too expensive to use, certainly for the commission, we couldn't afford anything like that. So when we could, we'd use tungsten lighting. This is the Swiss Canal Tunnel under Swansea. Um, and to get, uh, I was running a generator outside and we didn't have cables long enough to get in there. So we went around the government buildings and borrowed all the extension cables, ran them down the, the, the tunnel balance them on milk crates to keep them out of the mud. And uh, that's how we got the result. Again, the nice thing about this is you've got a tungsten light, you can see what you're doing. You know, with flash, of course, you haven't. Uh, Nancy, I think we'll recognize this. 
Uh, yeah, uh, this was, I, I, when I came to set this up, it had been pouring with rain all day, and, and you don't really want to run a, a, a 24 volt generator, a 240 volt generator when it's raining. And I, so I'd gone back to my, my, my hotel and I thought, well, I'll set the alarm clock for, you know, just before dawn. And if it stops raining, I'll, I'll go and do it. The alarm clock goes off, look out the window, it stopped raining. So I rush out there, run the cables across, and it was very wet, but I got away with that, I think. Uh, that was the end result, um, which, you know, if, it's, if you get the writing, lighting right, it works really well. Uh, so I did a lot of these things. I, as I used to spend a lot of time uh, at, at night in, in graveyards. And it always amazed me that nobody ever asked what I was doing. You know? <laughs> it was extraordinary. <laughs> um, on one occasion, I, I was, uh, was it, I think Whitford, I think it was, I was photographing the cross there. And it was about three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd left the, I'd, I'd opened the van up, because no one's around at three o'clock in the morning. I'd pile over here and rush over into the field, pull the lighting up. And I saw this car pull up and I thought, oh no. And I rushed over and the police car was there. And they said, what are you doing? They thought the van had been stolen. Whoever had got it just thrown all the gear out looking for things. And I said, well, I'm photographing the, the, the cross. And they go, really? And I said, well, go and stand in the field and I'll put the generators on. And they were so impressed, you know. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, what we used to do with, with tungsten in the old days, uh, one really nice technique for lighting interiors was known as painting with light. And you'd have, uh, you'd have a, a big cable drum. I made this thing. You had a big cable drum that you could run out and you'd, you'd dress yourself in black. And uh, this is doing things like churches, big churches. Um, what you could do on 5-4 sheet film, what you do is, is you get the 5-4 the, the sheet film is in you know, a, a, a square dark slide thing. And you tap it so the, the ground glass, uh, so the film is at the bottom of, of the holder. You put it in the back of the camera and in daylight, you'd expose it for the windows. Then you take them all out, make certain you have them right way around and uh, leave them aside. And uh, then you'd wait till it was dark and you'd put them back in carefully and tap it again to make certain film drop to the bottom. And then you'd do this painting with lights. So you'd, uh, you'd, you, you mustn't look back at the camera. You open the shutter and you go around the, uh, the church interior painting it with light. And it works really, really well. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got an example of that because uh, when I left the commission, I was requested uh, for security reasons to destroy all the images I had. So, so unfortunately, they are in the archives somewhere, but I, I can never find them. Uh, you're lucky you've got these. Uh, so it was an old, old PowerPoint I found on our projector, so I'm sure I shouldn't have them really. Don't tell them, Toby. You know? <laughs> um, so the only illustration I have is, is, is this. It's, um, it's, a, it's a photograph of a, of a bomb that's in the Black Museum in, in Salisbury. Um, this was planted in, in, on the Barbara Hepworth statue in, in Salisbury in 1970. And because you can move the light around, with a subject like this, normally you shine a light and it'd just be a mass of shadows. But because you're moving it around, you get a soft shadow behind it, you can still see the detail. That was what was really good about painting with light. Uh, but we moved on from painting with light to uh, flash guns. Uh, these are portable flash guns, they're about 1200 watts each. Uh, when we first ha had, had this sort of lighting, um, to, to synchronise them to the camera, you had to have uh, an extension cable, which was very thin, and you had these tiny little sockets, which half the time wouldn't work, and you spend your life sticking them in and pulling them out, firing and not taking the photographs, and you used to hate that. Then we moved on, and we got, uh, we got to infrared slave cells, uh, which sometimes worked, sometimes didn't but they didn't work if you had wood panelling around. I think because the wood panelling would probably absorb the, uh, the, the, the red that they were sensible, sensitive to. Uh, and then we came on to radio control, and that was really good. The problem is they're really expensive. These are £250 each. Uh, I bought three of these. <laughs> it's just a bit of an investment, this. But they're so good to use. It also meant that because you could programme them, you could set up so that different lights in different parts of it in a building you could fire separately, so you could fire more in one area than in another. Uh, but you have to try not to make things too complicated because it's very easy getting complicated. Uh, the, 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 they were um, when I was when I stopped using um, uh, uh, tungsten lighting on, on the stones, I was using the flash on them, and uh, you get some really good results on them.
we know this because we're going to see it later. <laughs> uh, I think this was taken on the occasion we were doing the, uh, the television filming, wasn't it? Uh, the other advantage of flash is that uh, if you use a very fast shutter speed, though you record the flash, you don't record the background. So in daylight, you can get an apparent night sign scene. This is, you know, this is at the same time, but you can see the Ogham inscriptions. Uh, and also on industrial sites, you know, a, a portable flash gun, particularly when you've got radio control, is a joy. <laughs> Uh, this is the uh, last firing of the Brimbo, at the Brimbo Steelworks. Um, there's lots of light from the actual uh, molten steel itself, but you have to use a flash to actually light the background so you can see what was behind it. Uh, when, I was, when I was doing this, I, uh, strange thing about access, uh, but when I turned up there, uh, we'd had an introduction to someone in their, gra in their graphics department. And he said, yeah, yeah, come along, take photographs. Uh, it was when they were going to close the Brimbo Steelworks down. I didn't realise that they actually had a meeting of the uh, the board from uh, from uh, British Steel who were there that day. And what they didn't want was press. What they didn't want was photographers. They really didn't want me. And the security people were really amused about this because uh, I just sort of turned up and they said, "Oh, help yourself." And they they provided someone in the hot in the hot metal area. They said, "Oh, we'd better have someone with you there." And I got this tap on my shoulder and I turned around. I mean, it was very, very noisy in there. And uh, I looked around and there was a diesel locomotive was behind me, which I hadn't even heard approaching mm. because the sound of these things is, is absolutely yeah. deafening. You're wearing big, uh, big earphones here. Uh, this is the other extreme. This is an ice works in Milford Haven. This is, uh, this is the, this, again, we got to do these things when it's like the last day. So you, you don't want to make mistakes. <laughs> Uh, this is the last uh, last production of ice at Milford Haven. Now, for, for the actual main building, uh, you could use daylight because long exposure didn't matter. But when you came to actually photograph the ice being poured from the moulds, um, and you've got people working there, you have to have the flash to, to, uh, to actually hold the action. Uh, and this is when you get to sort of complicated underground things. This is at Tafswell, the ironstone mines. Um, it's an amazing place. Again, you're in pitch darkness, so you have got light coming through the roof, but that's a 20 minutes exposure to get that light actually recording like that. And the rest of it is done with flash units, which are placed into side tunnels and fired uh, partially with radio control and partially, that's actually me uh, firing one of the guns next to me. <laughs> Again, you're in total darkness, so uh, the shutter, shutter is open on the camera. So you can't have a, a, a light, a, a torch on when you go back to the camera. So in pitch darkness, you're trying not to fall into that water, which is very deep. <laughs> and you're crawling around the edge, holding the wall, you find the camera. <laughs> uh, this is a, a softbox used on a flash gun. And what it gives you is, is, um, is very soft directional light, which is really good when you're okay. photographing plaster work. And the plaster work here is beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. That, uh, the, uh, the Conway Valley has, has got such a fantastic array of plaster work. Uh, it, just down the road from here at uh, Minan Hall, um, you've got this interior, which is just stunning. Again, you need sort of directional but soft light for these. Uh, here at, uh, at Guffin, uh, it's this is the this is over the altar. What you call it? The that's it. Yes, <laughs> chancel. Uh, so here, what I've done is I just put massive reflectors on the floor, and I'm firing guns onto the floor to light upwards. And the same here at Insel Court. Uh, here at St Baglins, um, it's actually the let. I mean, when I take photographs like this. Um, I wanted to look as natural as possible. In fact, this is natural at all because the left-hand side is, is one of those soft blocks, which is lighting from the side. And the right-hand side, which would be light coming through the door, can't be because you can't open the door that far. So actually it's got a reflector taped over the door and there's um, a flash gun fired from behind the, 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 um, the benches at the back onto that. So you get the impression that light's pouring in, which it isn't really. <laughs> uh, uh, Gouda Castle. Uh, here they've got the um, oh, yeah. these ama this ama amazing woodwork which um, Hearst took out and flew out to America 
It was never unpacked from its boxes and eventually it came back and they put it back in again. This sort of woodwork is, is very hard to photograph because, uh, because it's polished, it reflects the light back, but you also want to try to, try to side light it to show the detail better. So they're always a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a nightmare going to do these things. Uh, this is a Gruganok, a beautiful uh, woodwork there. Again, because it, the, the woodwork is actually dark, um, you haven't really got the shadow, the shadow to actually show up against the woodwork. But things like the softbox and things like this uh, produce a really good result with it. Uh, and the other thing with softboxes, if you've ever tried photographing uh, polished brass plaques in churches, anybody tried that? What you get is a reflection of yourself in it. <laughs> but there is a way around this. You no know, technology can get there. If you use a softbox to one side <clears throat> and you photograph it from the side, what you get is that. Now, to get that, <clears throat> either if you, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> what I haven't said is that um, essentially the black and whites to start with this are all on, the, on the large format. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the ones in color, uh, you are now talking digital. Uh, and this is done with a shift lens on the digital. The, you know, the shift lens works the same way as the movements would on, on a camera. It's just, uh, it's actually much more expensive because the digital, the, the shift lens on this, they're three and a half thousand pounds per lens. And I got two, I had two of these things. So it's, uh, it gets to be expensive, but you get a really good result because you put the camera to one side, use the shift movements over, it stays parallel and you get the shot. It's, it's such a nice way of doing these when it's done well. Uh, I've always liked storage porches. When you come to photograph architecture, I mean, a building, it's a massive empty room. So what can you do with an empty room? But you get a nice bit of architecture like this, you know, it's something you can play with. Um, but again, you need shift, shift movements on a camera to do this because for most people, you point your camera upwards, everything falls over backwards. But using shift lenses, uh, and the majority of my work on digital has been essentially with a couple of shift lenses, really 17 and 28 millimeter, and they give you really superb results. You know, these buildings were, were meant to impress, and they really do. When you come to places like uh, Trio, and um, when, you're, when you're working on sites like this, your ties, I like, <laughs> like Scarfell, uh, to the time of day. So essentially, you have to work your way around the, the outside when the light's right for it. Of course, when you move inside, with things like staircases, um, then it doesn't matter what time of day it is because you're doing the lighting yourself. And this is the other thing I like about buildings, so give me a nice sort of multi, uh, uh, storage porch or a staircase. They're the interesting things when you get to, when you get to the architecture. They're, they're quite difficult things to do because you have to light every single floor that's going to be in it. So this is where things like the radio control really come into their own because you're having to place your lights on different floors and then control them from, from the ground. That's where, where if, you're, if you're actually using um, a multiple sequence, uh, you can fire guns further in one area than another. And sometimes it's quite difficult getting the viewpoints as well. <laughs> Uh, this is what I used to carry out on site. Uh, this will just fit into the back of a large car, well, a very large estate, or people carry this quite good. Uh, there's a lot of gear to cart around, but you can see how complex it gets at times. Uh, if you're doing something like this, it is Bristol, St. Mark's. It's a lovely church, but though it's, it's really interesting to go around, there's no, way, there's no way you would ever see it like this. If you don't put the lighting in, you don't get the, the actual build of it. Uh, the, the lighting units are placed actually in the window spaces, top and, and bottom. And the copper at the front is lit with, with big soft boxes quite high up in the air down onto it. Because if you light it directly, you're just going to flash as you do, do with the, uh, the monitor recording. Um, now at Paris Castle, uh, this is an example which is actually essentially, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a film based approach, it's not digital. Uh, that's the end result. And the next sequence shows how it's done. <clears throat> the, 
the first exposure is to get the what's right for the daylight from the window. The rest of it, you can choose your own lighting for because you're putting your own lighting in. Then because there's a room at the far end, I could put a lighting unit in. I could light part of the passage part way down. And then another one in the next win, win room a bit further along. And another one for the front. I mean, normally this is what amateurs get when they photograph a site like this, just get the light at the front. But when you put them all together, you get that. But the, the shift lens means that you can move the viewpoint up so you get the ceiling in as well. So just a, a sequence of interiors at Plaste. Uh, this is Tinakoi to Arthog. And for things like this, so each time you take a photograph and you change the viewpoint of the room, all the lights have to be moved. Uh, this one I've been asked to photograph the bell cage. And um, again, you're in total darkness, actually without a floor. And you're having to bounce around and position the lights actually in the space around you without getting them in shot, without falling through the holes in the floor and without and dropping anything into the church below. <laughs> uh, near Crickius, again, to give the impression that it's daylight. In fact, what it is, is the lighting units are fired on the underside of the gallery here, which throws the light out and gives the impression the light's coming from the door. Of course, with, the, with these, you know, it's, you're playing with the light. You, you can, it's hard to know what's going to work well and what isn't. So I didn't know whether to have lighting behind or in front of this, but of course, you can just add the light where you like it. And here again, uh, to get depth to it, uh, your lighting units are positioned, the, the, the actual stands are behind the uprights so that you can get light behind them. So you can light from both sides to give depth to them. You know, particularly when you come to things like uh, root screens, there's there's such fantastic pieces of work. Uh, with uh, with fonts, uh, it gets to be more interesting. This is more like product photography. Now, the way that's done is uh, now that's a, that's a, the setup for it. Uh, you have six lights which are actually lighting that. Uh, the background is is black velvet, and you've got a soft box to the back, and you put that lot together, and you get that. Uh, but it takes probably an hour and a half to do each side. And uh, with something like this one, where you've got to photograph all the way round. Uh, because of the uh, the stands supporting the black velvets and all your lighting units, you actually, when you think about it, you're talking about 30 legs, which you have to move around and fit in. And each time you go round the thing, every single one has to be moved. <laughs> so you can spend a day doing this. <laughs> um, what I was saying before about painting with light, it occurred to me that it should be possible to do this with electronic flash. And uh, I first tried the Dinnerford Castle because with the digital, uh, you can do it on computer. I thought, well, light from one side then light from the other, and then put it together on computer. <laughs> so you end up with something which is actually practically impossible, but technically possible. And that technique has been used here in St. Edloise's church. Again, the banks of lights run down each side, and then the two frames are stuck together again digitally. It's a bit maybe overlit, I have to confess, you know. Ten seconds. <laughs> and that's the mess you have to sort out afterwards. <laughs> uh, here, uh, the, the main section is on one frame, and uh, this is the second frame to the back, and we put together on, on computer afterwards. But this one, uh, again, this is a sequence of how it's done. That's the end result. Um, that's the light recorded for the window to get the windows correct. That's the light from the windows lighting the interior, which is a different frame. Then uh, you're adding light underneath uh, from, from lights positioned underneath the gallery. And then you put the whole lot together and you drop the window lights in. Easy, <laughs> about five hours. <laughs> That's a, a baptism pool. 
light unit runs from the, the pool at the back. We run one quickly. Final examples. Last one to go. Come on. Right. <laughs> uh, this is the end result at, uh, at Marcellus's. Um, that's the exposure for the for the windows. Uh, that's the light from the daylight, which would normally light the interior. That's lighting units lighting the back section of the roof, the front section of the roof, then the left-hand roof, and then you put the whole together. When I went to do this, I got all the gear out and I was putting it in the church, and um, I got permission from the, from the vicar to do it. And uh, someone came and said, "Oh, this is unusual." I said, "Oh, I'm just photographing the interior." He said, "I didn't know you did that for funerals." I said, <laughs> funerals, at which point Vicar turned up and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't, wasn't able to contact you, but we've got a funeral. So, and I said, oh, I'll just move all the gear. <laughs> and on that note, I will stop there. <laughs> <laughs>